In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the opportunity to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things so that we might grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 19, verse 13. Matthew chapter 19, verse 13. Here we're dealing with Jesus and little children. 19.13 Then little children were brought to him so that he would lay his hands on them and pray. His disciples criticized them sharply. The disciples lack natural compassion. Uh, most of us have a natural compassion toward little children, except when they're acting out, but uh, a natural compassion toward children. And the disciples are guilty of discouraging young people. In fact, they're dis guilty of discouraging young people from listening to the Word of God or being associated with Jesus Christ. And these are the disciples doing this. They have hard heads and they still have a lot of legalism in them. And legalism drives young people away, always. And uh, usually the adults who are legalistic look down on children because they have sin natures, and of course they as legalists are perfect, so they look down their nose is at the children and drive them away from doctrine. And this is what the disciples are doing. And this uh, causes our Lord to state some principles. But Jesus said, Let the little children relax. The only time little children don't relax is when legalists make them that way. Children are usually naturally relaxed and uh, through a disaster they still might have a smile on their face. They're sometimes because they're completely oblivious, but often it's just the, their childhood, uh, uh, the way they act in childhood. So let the, children, let the little children relax and come to me. Always in the Bible, when it's dealing with salvation, it's talking about come to me. And these children, it doesn't give the age, but uh, most of them had passed accountability, all of them had passed accountability, so probably anywhere from five to teenage or young teenagers, five years old on up. And uh, so these, actually, these children are believers. They've already believed in Christ. That's why they're around him, and that's why they want their little heads touched by his hand. And why do they want that? Well, little children recognize that he was the Lord Jesus Christ. Recognize that he was the Son of God. And because of that, well, they would like nothing more than the Son of God to touch him on the head. To reach down and touch him on the head. They identified that with blessing. They identified the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God touching them on the head with blessing. And identified it with blessing. And we can understand that because they're children and... They see the Son of God and they say, I want to be touched by the Son of God. It's natural. And so these uh, children have believed in Christ and they're seeking blessing from the Lord. At 1915, and he placed his hands. This is an identification of blessing. And he, our Lord Jesus Christ, placed his hands on them and went on his way. If there's ever a verse in the Bible that talks about encouragement of children in doctrine and encouragement of children when it comes to learning the Word of God, this would be one. And yet the disciples want them to go away. Get out of here. We don't want little children around the Lord Jesus Christ. And our Lord rebukes them and, and says, uh, and this is where, and actually, uh, this is where he uh, says, Forsake not the children unto me. And the reason why is because the children are saved and uh, they want blessing. And so children should be encouraged in doctrine, not discouraged. Legalism always discourages children from doctrine. And then in 1916, we have a change of subjects. 
Here we have the facade of the rich young ruler. He's a young man, very wealthy, very self-righteous. And the most difficult people in the world outside of child abusers, as we've studied, to bring towards salvation or to uh, get them to believe in Christ are, on the one hand, self-righteous people, on the other hand, extraordinarily rich people. Now, there's nothing wrong with being rich, and we shouldn't tax the rich half to death, but uh, here is a self-righteous young man who is also rich, and he possesses two qualities that make it extremely hard to ever come to faith alone in Christ alone, because rich people always want to solve all their problems with wealth. They don't need Jesus Christ. They've got money. In that case, in those days, denarii. And the uh, self-righteous people don't need uh, Jesus Christ because they'll get into heaven by being good. So here we have a combination of a religious man and a rich person. So he's stuffed with self-righteousness and his wallet is stuffed with money. And he has not believed in Christ. He's in love with his fortune. A young rich man in love with his, his fortune and in love with himself. People in love with themselves and in love with their fortune are very difficult people to win over to Christ. 1916, then someone came to him and said, Good teacher, good teacher. This man's an unbeliever because he does not recognize him as Lord. All the disciples say Lord, except for Judas Iscariot. And he says, good teacher. Now, the good here from the Greek is actually good of intrinsic value. So on the one hand, he says he's good of intrinsic value, but on the other hand, he says teacher. Well, he's confused, and he does not believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior. And he does not use the word for deity, which is kurios, Lord. Then someone came to him and said, Good teacher, what good things must I do to gain eternal life? What good things must I do to gain eternal life? His premise is all wrong. And this is the one case in which our Lord is going to accept his premise. Not, not to agree with him and not to bring out the fact that you're saved by following the commandments, he accepts the premise because he's about to trap him. 1916, and uh, now moving on to 1917. This, by the way, what our Lord is about to use is the Socratic method. S-O-C-R-A-T-I-C. -C. The Socratic method. It's a method of uh, debating skills in which he is going to accept the premise in order to illustrate something. So in 1917, he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? Well, he already starts out with a uh, rhetorical question that's very good. And what he's saying is, You don't accept me as the Messiah. Why do you care what I think is good? You haven't believed in me. Why are you asking me? Who am I? He's already, you see, he knows who he is. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. And he knows that he should be asked about these things, but instead he simply accepts the premise and says, why do you ask me about who is good or what is good? You don't accept me? Why ask me? Then he goes on to say, only one is good. If you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. And this commandments here is plural. It's not the commandment we get out of John which says, this is the commandment, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's actually talking about the Ten Commandments along with the thousands of others of commandments found in the Old Testament. He's really saying this. If you were to look at it on the surface, you would gasp and say, or you might get happy and say, I told you, I told you I had to be following the law. Right here, Jesus says so. If you want to enter into eternal life, keep the commandments. Aha, I got you. No, he's using a debater's technique. And our Lord accepts this false premise that salvation is by keeping the law. And the, only way, the reason why he accepts the premise is because the only way he's going to go along with our Lord on these principles is if he accepts his premise. If he just jumped off the reservation and said, oh, you're not even saved by works anyway, believe in me, he knows he wasn't going to believe. So instead he's making a very good point by accepting the premise. It would be like uh, me going up to some of my relatives who 
like to follow the law religiously. And if I were to say to them, uh, if you want to enter into eternal life, you need to keep the commandments perfectly. Therefore, on Sunday, which is not the Sabbath, they think it is, but I'll accept their premise. Therefore, on Sunday, you better have the wife make three meals on Saturday so that she's not cooking on Sunday. That's working and it's against the law. And you better throw away the uh, Sunday morning uh, bacon. That's against the law. Can't eat bacon. It's against the Mosaic law. And so they are so self-righteous. I follow the law. I'm going to heaven because of that. And so I would just accept the premise and say, oh, you are? Well, if you are, throw away your bacon and make sure that everything is cooked on Saturday and not Sunday. And that would be a debater's technique, and this is what our Lord uses. And what we find out about this rich young ruler is that he thinks he's saved by being good, as many people are, or by following the law and following the commandments. But we note that our Lord is not... Uh, he is not uh, saying that this is right, that if you want eternal life, follow the commandments. He's not saying this is the way of salvation. In fact, if he were saying that, we would contradict with other uh, scriptures, and therefore uh, this contradiction would mean the Word of God is infallible, or not, it would mean the Word of God is fallible and it's infallible. And so in Romans 3.20, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Romans 3.20. That's one of the passages. You're not justified by the law. Neither is this man. Or Galatians 2.16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Another one. And so he is not saying, if you want to enter into eternal life, keep the commandments. He is simply putting himself, he's about to illustrate absurdity by being absurd, I guess you could say. And then in 1918, the rich young man says this, Which ones? he asked. And Jesus replied, Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not commit perjury. Jesus is right now deliberately spelling out all the commandments that he knows this young man has followed. This is what all the religious crowd follows even today. They do not murder. Of course not. They do not commit adultery. They do not steal. If they see anyone doing that, they're not saved in their minds, even though they could be. And they do not commit perjury, one of the uh, things in a courtroom that they did not do. And if they did, they would think they were going to hell. And so this man, our Lord setting him up into a trap, because while he's saying, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not commit perjury, he, this man's thinking through his head and he's saying, I haven't done that. And then he gets to adultery and he about has a heart attack. <gasps> no way, I've never done anything like that. And then uh, do not commit perjury. So he's nodding and agreeing with the Lord. Yep, I followed that one. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm good, I'm good to go. So he's deliberately setting up, setting this man up. Now in 1919, he's throwing some things in here that are outside of what he had been used to hearing. And this is because these laws are higher laws. And in 1919, I hope you all remember our study of Corban. In 1919, he says, Keep on honoring your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. Remember the issue of Corban. This man's rich. And all the rich people in those days had a way to get out of income tax. And the way to do it is to give all your property to the temple. Now, you can still make money on that property. You can still raise cattle. You can still uh, make a profit. But it doesn't really belong to you. It belongs to the temple. And because it belongs to the temple, they excuse you from paying taxes. And this became a gimmick to where if the parent they didn't have Social Security back then. So if the parents became ill and they couldn't take care of their parents, then what they would say, or they wouldn't want to take care of their parents because it costs so much money. So what they would say is, sorry, Mom and Dad, I can't help you. All this belongs to the temple. It was an excuse to get out of helping their parents. And that's why he brings up, keep on honoring your mother and father. This man's grown. He's a young man. He's rich. So he's already making it in the world. But he doesn't honor his father and mother. He is using the Korban. We get this from the earlier passages if you were here to study it.
and love your neighbor as yourself. That's another one he hasn't been doing. Now, oh, he, he's probably, he, he stopped shaking his head up and down by now, but he's not, he's going to lie to himself and say, I love my neighbor as myself. Uh, let me tell you, uh, the self-righteous person can lo- love no one gr- uh, better than he can love himself. They're so full of themselves, there's no way they could even have a capacity to love anyone else. It's all about them. And he's in love with his wealth and in love with his self-righteousness, and uh, there's no way he's going to admit he's, r- he's wrong here. And he brings out some higher forms. Keep on honoring your father and mother. He hasn't. He made Korban. He turned his money, uh, he gave his property to the temple so that he could have the excuse, I will not help my mother and father because I can't uh, spend this uh, property, I can't uh, help them out with this property because it belongs to the temple. Although he's been making profit off of it, he's not going to help his mother and father. And love your neighbor as yourself, as we mentioned, there's no way he follows this. But the young man, of course, lies to himself. And remember, there's a crowd around. So uh, when there's a crowd around, there's a lot of pressure on him to say the right thing. So in 1920, this young man said to him, I have kept all these things since accountability. In other words, he understood the age of accountability. But he understood the age of accountability as being, now I know what's right and wrong, I do what's right, and since I do what's right, I'm going to heaven. Since I was a good little boy and I've been a good young man, I'm going to heaven. I have kept all these things since I was young or since the age of accountability. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you want to be perfect, and this is how he thinks of himself, but our Lord's going to point out, no, you're not. Because if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give it to the poor. (coughs) Excuse me. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. This follow me means to follow him in regeneration. And of course, come unto me, all ye who labor and heavy laden, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is the same concept. Coming unto uh, Jesus Christ is believing in him, faith alone in Christ alone. So what's all of this? If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give it to the poor. Well, this man is self-righteous, and he's very wealthy. He's a penny pincher, and uh, he has no generosity. He would never help out anyone in terms of money. Not even his parents. That's why our Lord brings this up, because he knows it. He knows he's tight with his money. He's got all the money he will ever need in the world, but he's so tight with it, he's not going to even help out his parents. And how low is that? Very low. And this is why he brings it up. Hey, if you want to be perfect, since you think you're perfect, that's the indication, go sell your possessions and give it to the poor. And uh, he's not going to give his money away. And what he's doing is he's accepting his premise. This man, people who have been wealthy and are very wealthy, they buy everything. They buy their their way out of every situation. They have a problem, solve it with money. And so, since this man thinks this way, our Lord says, you have a problem. You're not going to heaven. You're rich, sell your possessions. And uh, it's, it's a way to shock him. It's a way to personally shock this man. And the funny thing we'll get out of this is that the disciples don't even understand he's using a technique. The disciples take it all literal and say, my goodness, i got to go back and start following all these commandments again. Got to throw away the bacon, etc. And uh, it just shows how hard-headed they are. And But um, that's a point in which we can take comfort because all of us are hard-headed and we need to grow up and it takes humility. And so they're listening to this and they hear the Lord ac- accept the premise and they're just totally shocked. They knew they were saved by believing in Christ. Now the Lord says, uh, follow the commandments. And now they're just, uh, they're tore up. They're in knots. The disciples are in knots because they don't understand what our Lord's doing. And if anybody were to just read this without uh, knowing all that's behind it, they would get torn up in knots because they would just flip too, as some people do if they got a problem close their eyes and flip through the Bible and put your finger down and look down. And if they were to point their finger at this verse where it says follow the commandments and they knew they were saved by faith alone in Christ alone and not by their works, they would about to, they would get torn up and they would get confused just as the disciples are. It must be put into a context 
and it must be put into what our Lord's trying to do. He's trying to make this man understand that he's not perfect. First thing a self-righteous person and a rich ruler needs to understand is he's not perfect. That's the first step in knowing that you need a Savior. The law was designed so that you would know that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. And so he thought he was perfect by following the law, so he doesn't need a Savior. And right now he's just making it clear, yes, you do, you're not perfect. And then, uh, keep uh, moving on here, when the young ruler heard this, he went away grieved, for he had many possessions. He wasn't about to give them away, and he was focusing on his many possessions, and he was not going to follow Christ, he was not going to believe in Christ, and he's going away grieved because what he was doing, he wanted to get praised by the Lord, as many self-righteous people do. They want some praise from the pastor. In this case, he wanted praise from the good teacher. And he wanted the good teacher to praise him so he could go back and say, uh, the good teacher, Jesus, told me that I'm good enough to go to heaven. That's the only reason he came up to him was to affirm his self-righteousness. And when the Lord did not affirm his self-righteousness, but tell him you're not perfect, if you were perfect, uh, you would be generous. And if you were perfect, uh, and if you wanted to really become perfect, you must believe in me, then receive plus R. And that is what he was telling this man, but this man wasn't about to hear that. And he was grieved because he didn't get what he wanted out of the conversation as he thought he was. Everyone else had always told him he was great. Everyone in the synagogue pat him on the back. And the reason why was because he was rich. He's a rich man in a synagogue, able to give a lot of money to any, any of the synagogues he chose. So when they saw this rich man dressed in nice clothes walk into the synagogue, well, he got so much praise heaped on him simply because he was rich. And simply because the synagogue and all the people involved in the synagogue wanted his money. So no one had ever, well, he had never had a reality check. Now our Lord gives him one and says, you're not perfect. You're not that great. If you were that great, you would have sold all your possessions and given it to the poor. Now that might make you great, but he was accepting the premise. It still wouldn't get him into heaven. Only way to go to heaven, faith alone in Christ alone. This was a way to humble this man because the first step in believing in Christ is humility. When you believe in Christ, it takes humility. When you rebound, it takes humility. This man needed to be humbled, and our Lord humbled him, but he never came around to faith alone in Christ alone anyway. And so the man left. So then Jesus said to his disciples, A point of truth, or verily, verily, I say unto you, it is difficult for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. We've noted why. Because they buy their way every way, everywhere. A lot of rich people think they can buy their way into heaven. If they give uh, 10% to the church and they're millionaires, they think they're doing something great. $100,000 to the church, that'll surely get them a ticket into heaven, they think. And so, again I say, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. The eye of a needle is not talking about that thing you sew with. The eye of a needle is, it's a, there's a gate in the city. And at night they close the gate. And there is an eye of the gate that is open for latecomers into the city. And it's so small it's very hard for camels to get through. And a camel is a stubborn animal just as stubborn as a donkey. And so they're riding this camel and they get to the gate and it... And you know how animals are. They don't want to try to squeeze through a small area. They get claustrophobic, especially if they're being forced to squeeze through it. And so the rider is smacking them, and they get ornery and say, and they're not going to do it. And he's making the analogy, look, these people who are rich, and you give them the gospel, it's just like you're uh, trying to force a camel through a small hole in, in the gate, in the city gate. And they're going to react and bulk. And they want to, they, well, they become very self-righteous just because they got money. And everybody has bowed down to them because they have money and they want a piece of that money. And everybody praises them because they got money. And society looks up on them. So they feel very self-righteous. And so somebody gives them the gospel. They've always done everything for themselves. 
They've thought of themselves as self-made men, which is a farce. We don't even breathe apart from the grace of God. But they say, I'm a self-made man. I did all this with my own hands. I created all this wealth and created all these jobs. And then somebody comes along, you're going to hell, believe in Christ, and it doesn't re register with them. They're, they're too great to need a Savior. So this is what our Lord says. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, we noticed what that was, than for a rich person to enter into, into the kingdom of God. Then in 1925, the disciples were greatly astonished when they heard this and said, and they're starting to get tore up. They're starting to doubt their eternal security and they're starting to wonder all of a sudden, am I going to have to work my way into heaven now that the Lord has said all this? I thought he was teaching differently. Now he says all this, and now I'm not sure. And they were, they're dull, dull of thinking. They don't even know what our Lord's trying to do. So they're all talking, and they get worried. And they say, then who can be saved? If a rich man, if it's this hard for a rich man to be saved, if this good old fellow over here who came up and is a good young man, I knew him, this is what they're saying to themselves. I knew this young man. He's a nice fellow. Follows the Mosaic Law. A rich man. Uh, and uh, if he can't get into heaven, how's anybody going to get into heaven? This is what they started saying to each other. 1926. Jesus looked at them and said, This is impossible with mankind. But with God, all things are possible. He brings it back down to the fact that man can't, mankind cannot save himself, either through good works or anything else. You can't work your way into heaven, and you can't follow the commandments and go to heaven in that manner. And he's saying mankind cannot do it. But with God, all things are possible. And of course, God made a plan by which all of us can have salvation. So it's possible to have salvation. The fact that our... These, the fact that these disciples didn't understand the basic points of salvation meant that they hadn't been listening for two years. They were there, but they, they had... Obviously, uh, what happens is legalism puts a lot of scar tissue on the soul and it's hard to push those old ways out. It takes time. And uh, while these disciples were positive because most people who are legalistic and religious, if they hear it and they don't like it, they're out the door. But these disciples had grown up under legalism, and then they hear it, and it's different, but they're, not, uh, they're humble enough to say, well, I'll keep listening. And they're humble enough to get that crap out of their souls. Now, most people aren't humble enough. That's why there were only twelve disciples. So Jesus looked at that. Well, there were many disciples, students of the Lord. There were the twelve that he chose. And uh, the reason why, and they really are an astonishing example of how it's hard for legalism to get flushed out. Then Peter said to him, 1927. We never hear about any of the other disciples. It's just Peter here and Peter there. Then Peter said to him, now he's getting a little self-righteous. You can see that uh, he has a tendency toward legalism because he saw this rich young ruler and the rich young ruler is not going to go to heaven. Jesus Christ made it clear, said you're not perfect. You haven't given up everything uh, to the poor and you're not following me as in you haven't believed in me. And so Peter said to him, well, he starts thinking about himself right off and he says, aha, uh -huh. Well, I shouldn't be worried, neither should these people be worried, because uh, we've left everything and followed you. He made the issue himself. And he says, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? He's a funny fellow. I like Peter, because if it weren't for Peter, we wouldn't get a lot of these examples of stupidity. 1928. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, you who have followed me, that is to follow him in regeneration, you who have believed in me, they followed the Lord in regeneration, that means they're saved. Now, there must be a parenthesis here, I don't know if your Bible has one, there must be a parenthesis right after in, those who have followed me, and that is in generation, there should be a parenthesis here. And what do parentheses do? 
It's, a, it's like a, an aside, a total change of subject that is put within the sentence. When the Son of Man <clears throat> sits on his glorious throne, you also will sit on twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And whoever has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or land because of me, will receive a hundred times as much. And then in parenthesis, and that's true. This is dealing with the spiritual life. This is dealing with a post-salvation spiritual life. If you grow in grace and in knowledge, oftentimes it takes certain sacrifices. And uh, while the road is gracious and uh, it's easy in terms of growing in grace and in knowledge, but oftentimes, uh, well, take a missionary for an example. He must leave a house, leave his brothers, sisters, father, mother, uh, I, uh, sometimes children even, to go on a missionary journey, leaves the children back with the wife. Or land, maybe they were prosperous and they had to leave everything they've ever had and go on a missionary trip. And uh, this, is, this is not uh, a, a, a point in which you can be ascetic. And you can't say to yourself, I have done this in life and I've given up this and that and the other thing. Therefore, I'm going to receive a hundred times as much in heaven. What he's doing is he's saying, yes, Peter, you did leave your uh, fishing company that you owned. Yes, you did give up everything to follow me. And Peter, you will receive a hundred times as much in heaven. And that's all he's saying. Now, then it goes on, we'll inherit eternal life. You don't inherit eternal life because you have left your houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or land. If that were the case, I wouldn't be here. I'd be somewhere else. I would have left everything. What would you do? You see, there's a, there's a logic to it, and he has to answer Peter because Peter has lumped the two together. Peter has said, I followed you, I believed in you, and I've left everything. So on the one hand, you believed in Christ, you're going to heaven. On the other hand, you're, you're going to live a spiritual life, Peter, so you'll receive a hundred times as much. Some people receive ten times as much, some a hundred, some none. Some simply believe in Christ and go to heaven, and from then on never do anything with their spiritual life, and so they go to heaven as losers. Others uh, grow in grace enough to where they receive ten times as much. This is dealing with eternal reward. And they believe, so they inherit eternal life. Then in 1930, But many who are first into the kingdom will be last in rewards. And many who are last to enter will be first. But many who are first, this refers into the kingdom, will be last. That means in rewards. And many who are last will be first. Now, but many who are first deals with, uh, well, first century. Peter was first, uh, one of the first, in believing in Christ and was, would be first into the kingdom. And others there had been first. And many of the first century believers were first to believe. But many of them will be last in rewards because they didn't grow up spiritually. And a lot of people, uh, they used to, I don't know if they do today, but they want to go back to the first century type of worship because there was a lot of healing going on, a lot of miracles, a lot of speaking in tongues. I guess the Pentecostals want to go back there. And they say, if only I had lived in the first century, I would be so great speaking in tongues and doing all of this experiential stuff that is meaningless today. Yet uh, many of the first generation, the first, uh, the 100, the first century, many of them were terrible believers, like the Corinthians, first century believers, terrible, losers, and they'll be last in rewards. Many of them will be last in rewards. And many who are last, who would that be? Maybe some of us. Definitely people in the tribulation, because remember, he's talking to Jews here, and so... A lot of people in the tribulation will be first in rewards. Last to enter the kingdom, first in rewards. Maybe it's you, first in reward. One of the last people in history to believe in Christ and 
one of the first who receives the rewards. That's all that means. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of the Word. May we be encouraged uh, by this to grow in grace and in knowledge so that we will not be last in rewards, but first in rewards. And even though we may be last in terms of uh, the last believers, or uh, if this is the time in which we're moving toward uh, the tribulation, maybe, maybe not, uh, we don't know, but... If it is, then we will be one of the last in, in terms of entering the kingdom, but one of the first in terms of receiving rewards. Therefore, let us be motivated to grow in grace and in knowledge so that we might glorify you. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.